Frankenstein, or the Modern Prometheus, by Mary Shelley. Chapter 11. It is with considerable difficulty that I remember the original error of my being. All the events that of that period appear confused and indistinct. A strange multiplicity of sensations seized me, and I saw, felt, heard, and smelled at the same time. And it was, indeed, a long time before I learned to distinguish between the operations of my various senses. By degrees I remember a stronger light pressed upon my nerves, so that I was obliged to shut my eyes. Darkness then came over me, and troubled me, but hardly had I felt this when, by opening my eyes, as I now suppose, the light poured in upon me again. I walked, and I believe, descended, but I presently found a great alteration in my sensations. Before, dark and opaque bodies had surrounded me, impervious to my touch or sight, but now I now found that I could wander on at liberty with no obstacles, which I could not surmount or avoid. The light became more and more oppressive to me, and the heat wearying me as I walked, I sought a place where I could receive shade. This was the forest near Ingolstadt, and here I lay by the side of a brook, resting from my fatigue until I felt tormented by hunger and thirst. This roused me from my nearly dormant state, and I ate some berries which I had found hanging on the trees or lying on the ground. I slacked my thirst at the brook, and then, lying down, was overcome by sleep. It was dark when I awoke. I felt cold also, and half frightened, as it were, instinctively, finding myself so desolate. Before I had quitted your apartment, on a sensation of cold, I had covered myself with some clothes, but these were insufficient to secure me from the dews of night. I was poor, helpless, miserable wench. I knew and could distinguish nothing. But feeling pain invade me on all sides, I sat down and wept. Soon a gentle light stole over the heavens and gave me a sensation of pleasure. I stared up and beheld a radiant form rise from among the trees. The moon, I gazed with a kind of wonder. It moved slowly, but it enlightened my path, and I again went out in search of berries. I was still cold, when under one of the trees I found a huge cloak, with which I covered myself and sat upon, down upon the ground. No distinct ideas occupied my mind, I was confused. I felt light and hunger and thirst and darkness, innumerable sounds rang in my ears, and on all sides various scents saluted me. The only object that I could distinguish was the bright moon, and I fixed my eyes on that with pleasure. Several changes of the day and night passed, and the orb of night had greatly lessened, when I began to distinguish my sensations from each other. I gradually saw plainly the clear stream that supplied me with drink, and the trees that shaded me with their foliage. I was delighted when first I first discovered that a pleasant sound, which often saluted my ears, proceeded from the throats of the little winged animals who had often interpreted the alert, intercepted the light from my eyes. I also began to observe with greater accuracy the forms that surrounded me, and to perceive the boundaries of the radiant roof of light which canopied me. Sometimes I tried to imitate the pleasant songs of the birds, but was unable. Sometimes I wished to express my sensations in my own mode, but the uncouth and inarticulate sounds which broke from me frightened me into silence again. The moon had disappeared from the night, and again, with a lessened form, showed itself, while I still remained in the forest. My sensations had by this time become distinct, and my mind received every day additional ideas. My eyes became accustomed to the light and to perceive objects in their right forms. I distinguished the insect from the herb, and by degrees one herb from another. I found that the sparrow uttered none but the harshest tones, whilst those, those of the blackbird and thrush were sweet and enticing. One day, when I was oppressed by cold, I found a fire which had been left by some wandering beggars, and was overcome with delight at the warmth I experienced from it. In my joy I thrust my hand into the live embers, but quickly drew it out again, with a cry of pain. How strange, I thought, that the same cause should produce such opposite effects. I examined the materials of the fire, and to my joy found it to be composed of wood. I quickly collected some branches, but they were wet and would not burn. 
I was pained at this, and sat wa still watching the operation of the fire. The wet wood, which I had placed near the heat, dried in itself become inflamed. I reflected on this, and by touching the various branches, I discovered the cause and busied myself in collecting a great quantity of wood, that I might dry it, and have a plentiful supply of fire. When night came on and brought sleep with it, I was in the greatest fear lest my fire should be extinguished. I covered it carefully with dry wood and leaves and placed wet branches upon it, and then, spreading my cloak, I lay on the ground and sank into sleep. It was morning when I awoke, and my first care was to visit the fire. I uncovered it, and a gentle breeze quickly fanned it into flame. I observed this also, and contrived a fan of, of branches which roused the embers when they were nearly extinguished. When night came again I found with pleasure that the fire gave light as well as heat, and that the discovery of this element was useful to me in my food, for I have found that some of the offals that the travellers had left had been roasted, and tasted much more savoury than the berries I gathered from the trees. I tried, therefore, to dress my food in the same manner, placing it on the live embers. I found the berries were spoiled by this operation, and the nuts and roots much improved. Food, however, became scarce, and I often spent the whole day searching in vain for a few acorns to assuage the, pain, the pangs of hunger. When I found this, I resolved to quit the place that I had hitherto inhabited, to seek for one where the few wants I experienced would be easily, more easily satisfied. In this emigration I exceedingly lamented the loss of fire, which I had obtained through accident, and knew not how to reproduce it. I gave several hours to the serious consideration of this difficulty, but I was obliged to re relinquish all supply, all attempt to supply it, and wrapping myself in my cloak, I had struck across the wood towards the setting sun. I passed three days in these rambles, and at length discovered the open country. A great fall of snow had taken place the night before, and the fields were of one uniform white. The appearance was dis disconsolate and I found my feet chilled by the cold, damp substance that covered the ground. It was about seven in the morning, and I longed to obtain food and shelter. At length I perceived a small hut on a rising ground which had doubtlessly been built for the convenience of some shepherd. This was a new sight to me, and I examined the structure with great curiosity. Finding the door open, I entered. An old man sat in it near a fire over which he was preparing his breakfast. He turned on hearing a noise, and perceiving me, shrieked loudly, and quitting the hut, ran across the field with, a sp with the speed of his debilitated, of which his debilitated form hardly seemed capable. His appearance differed from any I had ever before seen, and his flight somewhat surprised me. But I was enchanted by the appearance of the hut. Here the snow and rain could not penetrate; the ground was dry, and it presented to me then as exquisite and divine a retreat as pandemonium appeared to the devil to the demons of hell after their sufferings in the lake of fire i greedily devoured the remnants of the shepherd's breakfast which consisted of bread cheese milk and wine the latter however i did not like then overcome then overcome by fatigue i lay up down among some straw and fell asleep it was noon when i awoke and allured by the warmth of the sun which shone brightly on the white ground I determined to recommence my travels, and thus, depositing the remains of the peasant breakfast in a wallet I found, I proceeded across the fields for several hours, until at sunset I arrived at a village. How miraculous did this appear! The huts, the neater cottages, the stately houses engaged my admiration by turns. The vegetables in the garden, the milk and cheese that I saw placed at the windows of some of the cottages, allured my appetite. One of the best of these I entered, but I had hardly placed my foot within the door before the children shrieked, and one of the women fainted. The whole village was roused. Some fled, some attacked me, until, grievously bruised by stones and other kinds of missile weapons, I escaped to the open country, and fearfully took refu refuge in a low hovel, quite bare, and making a wretched appearance after the palaces I had beheld in the village. This hovel, however, joined a cottage of neat and pleasant appearance, but after my late dearly bought experience I dared not enter it. My place of refuge was constructed of wood, but so low that I could enter it 
I could with difficulty sit upright in it. No wood, however, was placed on the earth which formed the floor, but it was dry, and although the wind entered it by innumerable chinks, I found it an agreeable asylum from the snow and rain. Here, then, I retreated and laid down to have happy to have found a shelter, however miserable from the inclemency of the season, and still more from the barbarity of man. As soon as morning dawned, I crept from the can my kennel, that I might view the adjacent cottage, and discover if it could remain in the habitation I had found. It was situated against the, black the back of the cottage, and surrounded on both sides, on the sides which were exposed by a pigsty, in a clear pool of water. One part was open, and by that I had crept in, but now I covered every crevice by which I might be perceived with stone and wood, yet in such a manner that I might move on the occasion to pass out, all the light I enjoyed came through the sty, and that was sufficient for me. Having thus arranged my dwelling, and carpeting it with clean straw, I retired, for I saw the figure of a man in the distance, and I remembered too well my treatment the night before to trust myself in his power. I had first, however, provided for my sustenance for the day by a loaf of coarse bread, which I purloined, and a cup from which I drank more conveniently than from my hand of the pure water which flowed by my retreat. The floor was a little raised, so that it was kept perfectly dry, and by its vicinity to the chimney of the cottage it was tolerably warm. Thus being provided, I resolved to reside in this hovel until something should occur which might alter my determination. It was indeed a paradise compa compared to the bleak forest, my former residence, and the rain dropping branches and dank earth. I ate my breakfast with pleasure, and was about to remove a plank to procure myself a little water when I heard a step, and looking through a small chink I beheld a young creature, with a pail on her head, passing before my hovel. The girl was young and of gentle demeanour, unlike what I have since found cottagers and farm ser house servants to be. Yet she was meanly dressed a coarse blue petticoat and a linen jacket being her only garb. Her fair hair was plaited, but not adorned. She looked p patient, yet sad. I had lost sight of her, and in about a quarter of an hour she returned bearing the pail, which was now partially filled with milk. As she walked along, seemingly uncommoned by the burden, a young man met her, whose countenance expressed a deeper despondence. Uttering a few sounds with an air of melancholy, he took the pail from her head and bore it to the cottage himself. She followed, and they disappeared. Presently I saw the young man again, with some tools in his hand, cross the field behind the cottage, and the girl was also busied, sometimes in the house, sometimes in the yard. On examining my dwelling, I found that one of the windows of the cottage had formerly occupied a part of it, but the panes had been filled up with wood. In one of these was a small and almost imperceptible perceptible chink through which the eye could just penetrate. Through this cre crevice a small room was visible, whitewashed and clean, but very bare of furniture. In one corner, near a small fire, sat an old man, leaning his head on his hands in a disconsolate attitude. The young girl was occupied in arranging the cottage, but presently, presently she took something out of a drawer, which employed her hands, and she sat beside the old man who, taking up an instrument, began to play, and to produce sounds sweeter than the voice of the thrush or the nightingale. It was a lovely sight, even to me, poor wretch, who had never be, never beheld aught be beautiful before. The silver hair and benevolent countenance of the aged cottager won my reverence, while the gentle manners of the girl enticed my love. He played a sweet, mournful air, which I perceived drew tears from the eyes of his amiable companion of which the old man took no notice, until she sobbed audibly. Then he pronounced a few sounds, and the fair creature, leaving her work, knelt at his feet. He raised her and smiled with such kindness and affection, that I felt sensations of a particular and overpowering nature. They were a mixture of pain and pleasure, such as I had never before expressed, experienced, from either hunger or cold, warmth nor food, and I withdrew from the window, unable to bear these emotions. Soon after the young man returned, bearing on his shoulders a load of wood. The girl met him at the door, 
helped to relieve him of his burden, and taking some of the fuel into the cottage, placed it on the fire. Then she and the youth went apart into a nook of the cottage, and he showed her a large loaf and a piece of cheese. She seemed pleased, and went into the garden for some roots and plants, which she placed in water, and then upon the fire. Afterward she continued her work, whilst the man, the young man went into the garden, and appeared busily employed in digging and pulling up roots. After he had been employed thus, been employed thus about an hour, the young woman joined him, and they entered the cottage together. The old man had in the meantime been pensive, but on the appearance of his companions he assumed a more cheerful air, and they sat down to eat. The meal was quickly dispatched. The young woman was again occupied in arranging the cottage, and the old man walked before the cottage in the sun for a few minutes, leaning on the arm of the youth. Nothing could exceed in beauty the contrast between these two excellent creatures. One was old, with silver hairs, and a countenance beaming with benevolence and love. The younger was slight and graceful in his figure, and his features were moulded with the finest symmetry, yet his eyes and attitude expressed the utmost sadness and despondency. The old man returned to the cottage, and the youth, with tools different from those he had used in the morning, directed his steps across the fields. Night quickly shut in, but, to my extreme wonder, I found the cottagers had a means of pro prolonging light by the use of tapers, and was delighted to find it that in the setting of the sun did not put an end to the pleasure I experienced in watching my human neighbors. In the evening the young girl and her companion were employed in various occupations, which I did not understand, and the old man again took up the instrument, which produced the divine sounds that enchanted me in the morning. As soon as he had finished, the youth began not to play, but to utter sounds that were monotonous, and neither resembling the harmony of the old man's instrument, nor the songs of the birds, I since found out that he read aloud, but at that time I knew nothing of the science of words or letters. The family, after having been thus occupied for a short time, extinguished their lights and retired, as I conjectured, to rest. End of chapter 11